I was born in Washington, D.C. I was an Army brat. Then we moved to Syracuse for a couple of years, but the vast majority of the time growing up was Orlando, Florida, because uh, my father worked for Disney for 35 years. He built the point of sale computer system for Epcot Center and just incredible amount of stuff after that. So yeah, I grew up in Orlando, Florida. I was a Disney child a through and through. Like that was pretty much my playground growing up because my dad worked there. We got free tickets all the time. Yeah. You were probably one of those kids who was sick of Disneyland. Oh yeah. I was that child. I was like, oh yeah, Haunted Mansion. <laughs> Spoiled to the rotten core. I look back now and I'm up in California right now, right near Disneyland. And any chance I can take to take my children to Disneyland, I don't even hesitate. It's a very important place in my life. I saw this beautiful piece that you wrote about bringing your kids to Disneyland and how it's their favorite thing and how I think Elsa and Anne, they made the day for you, even though it started not being so great, but then at the very end, it is something really magical for your kids. It really is. And it's a funny thing. My two daughters at the time, I have three children now, but I only had two at the time. We had this terrible day at Disneyland. It was hot. The kids were just in a mood and... We're just getting on each other's nerves. And there's this area in California Adventure that has all these television screens that are all over the place. And it's my oldest daughter's favorite place. She's nonverbal, but she loves screens. She loves everything that's going on screen. So it's also my favorite place because it's the most air conditioned place in all of Disneyland. We would hang out there and just watch the videos a lot. And one time we were there and we were tired. It was the end of the day. And my wife and other daughter came in and we we're just hanging out trying to cool down and slowly but surely we're noticing people leaving the building because we figure all they're closing as they're leaving a bunch of employees are coming we figured oh it must be like employee training that's about to happen or anything like that and all of a sudden one of the employees comes up to us and goes look we've been noticing you guys around the park looks like you had kind of a tough day and we'd like to cheer you up and they brought their character versions of Anna and Elsa in to play with my daughters. One of the animation teachers made a drawing for my daughters. It was just this, they call it magic moments that Disney provides. And um, it was one of the most special days as a family that we've ever had. <laughs> when you have days like that, you can't help be a lifetime fan. Going back to your childhood, you had all that exposure to Disneyland. You were also doing musical theater as well? Yeah. So I grew up going to Catholic school. We moved. And it was my first chance to go to a public school, but the public school itself uh, happened to be a, a magnet school for the, for Florida arts. And I showed up there and I ran into an old friend that I knew from like the third grade whose name was Eric Garbus. And he just dragged me into the theater. He was like, this is what you're going to do now. I was like, okay. and just immediately I got in with these people and we started doing these shows. And I went to high school with this just incredible array of talent from like members of the Mickey Mouse Club to members of Luis Fonzi, who did a Despacito. I wasn't in a class with them, but um, Wayne Brady also went to our high school. Just great, great talent musically and acting wise. That's all we did was we would do these shows, we'd do these musicals, and it was how we just had fun. And it, it's so strange to think about now that that's how I enjoy my life because I'm so not that guy now. <laughs> but that got me my start in the entertainment world. I was doing that. I was volunteering at a local improv theater in Orlando, Florida called the SAC Theater, where I would volunteer to be an usher. And they would put on the improv shows and bohemian night shows. And that just got into, for me, trying to figure out what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. It was time to go to college. And I got offered a scholarship to, I guess you would call it a trade school. It wasn't necessarily a college. It was at AMDA, AMDA. The American Musical and Dramatic Academy. I wanted to go because I, I've always been a big proponent of just kind of knowing what I want, but then wanting to know everything about it. So I decided that this was the school I was going to go to because first off, it's going to bring me to New York City. That's where all the theater is happening. And secondly, it's just what I want to do. I don't want to take calculus. I just wanted to do shows. That's all it came down to. And then I would sneak away. I would cut classes to go to Broadway auditions. And the worst thing that happened to me during this point was I would get callbacks, which to a young guy who doesn't want to be in school anymore, that's enough false hope to really be like, oh, you don't need school, kid. They already watch you. The reality of it is, is I'm a very large human. I'm six foot seven, which makes me unusual in the theater world. So people 
called me back just to give me a second look. I can look at that now. I've been through a lot of it. But I started working in shows. I convinced my parents to let me drop out after a year of AMTA. And I just started working. And I worked for like four years straight. And in four years, I maybe had like two weeks off. And I was doing shows everywhere. Just regional theater, national tours. It was really easy to get work. I was never the star. I was never like a headliner or anything like that. But I was always unique enough that they would stick me in the back somewhere. Usually is. You know, oh, we need someone who looks like they could beat someone up. <laughs> and by the fourth year, I got really miserable. I was just tired of traveling. Like I said, my dad was working for Disney and they offered him to move out to California permanently. And my mom was going to go. And the weekend she needed to move, she threw her back out. So I was on the phone with her and I was miserable on the tour. I said, tell you what, I want to quit my tour. I'll come there. I'll, I'll help you move out, but I want to come with you. And they'll look like, So I made the trek out to California. Hooked up with a bunch of friends who were trying to be out here, be performers as well. Tried the acting thing and discovered that as easy as it was for me to get work in theater, it was the exact opposite when it came to film and TV. No one wanted me. Because a big difference between film and theater is that in theater, I can play a Viking or I can play an old man. It's theater. We can make you look a certain way. We can make, dress you up a certain way to help convince the audience that you have a certain skill set or whatever. When you try it out for, see what was one of my biggest first auditions was Married With Children. Try out to be a basketball player for Married With Children. They actually get NBA players to come to the audition. <laughs> and then you, you go, oh, you don't want someone who pretends. You actually want someone who actually can do the job. So that's when I slowly started learning that it was going to be a lot harder than it was. But one of the first things you got to do when you come out to act is you got to get an agent. So my friends and I, I got together and we started just handwriting agents and stuff like that. And we got some responses and all the agents said the same thing. Where's your demo reel? We're like, oh, well, what's a demo reel? Uh, well, demo reel is a bunch of clips of you acting that we can send to casting directors, that sort of thing. So they can see what you look like on camera, see if you can act, so on and so forth. None of us have any of that. We all worked in Florida where everyone knew each other. So you never needed anything like that. So we decided, uh, well, what if we just filmed a couple one minute scenes, just get ourselves on tape. Well, this was 1998, 99, before cameras yeah. started getting remarkably cheap. Uh, we went to a couple companies. Yeah. I think we pitched them doing like five one minute scenes and they wanted to charge $50,000 wow. to do the whole thing. Yeah. Because back then that's how much you could charge for that kind of work. So we're like, ah, you, you know, we're all 20 years old, 21 years old. We're like, ah, we could do this. So we all got together and we decided, okay, let's rent a camera, rent a light, rent a boom mic. And so it, it just came down to, okay, who's going to hold the camera? I have the camera. Who's going to hold the mic? You hold the mic. Oh, we'll switch off. And then at the end, it was like, well, who's going to put this all together? Hey, we'll put it together. How hard could it be? So I downloaded Adobe Premiere and we put the stuff together. It's real simple stuff. Like a master shot, close up. But I put it together. So we all got our little one minute scenes and then it got passed around because they would have their scenes and they would show it to their friends. And one of the first questions that they would ask, well, who did that for you? Oh, my friend Rob. Oh, okay. And then what happens is if you stick around Los Angeles long enough around people who are active, they start working. So their friends now become higher up. So slowly but surely, I would start getting calls from leads from television shows. I'm submitting myself for the NAACP awards. Can you put together a reel for me? Oh yeah, sure. And then those calls turned into producers saying, Hey, can you put together this little presentation for me? That sort of thing. And then as the years went on, people called me for acting. People called me for editing just started. And then by the time I was about I had 20. 26, 27, I got fired from a visual effects place for not knowing my software. It was an editing job. And they asked me going in, they're like, oh, we have this thing called Final Cut Pro. Do you know it? I was like, oh yeah, sure. Yeah. Went in there, I tanked. It was terrible. And they rightfully let me go, like just without a doubt. When they let me go, I remember I drove away from the place and I pulled by this school I used to see in Burbank called Video Symphony. Video Symphony taught every form of post-production, Avid, Premiere Pro, Final Cut Pro. And I pulled over and I went in there and asked for a tour. And I decided that day that I was going to be an editor because I walked away mad from the job for firing me. I analyzed that. And I was like, oh, that actually hurts my feelings that they thought I wasn't good at it. Maybe I really like this. And so I decided then that it was like a year program that said I was going to put everything into it to just make the most of it. So I was living with my parents at the time. So they helped out immensely. 
I've worked like in the warehouse at Best Buy or going to school during the day and like using the lab as much as I possibly could. And I, I did the year program in like six months just because I was there so much. And then I got out of there and hit the ground running. And all of a sudden I started working all these visual effects gigs, it was very small jobs, but on big productions, Peter Pan, the Hulk, the Ang Lee version of the Hulk. And I mean, just the, the most minor of jobs, but enough to get accredited, which helped for the next, because once you have the big recognizable credit, you can get a bigger job on a smaller thing. So that started lifting. And I was getting all this work in visual effects and then it just stopped, it just died. And I couldn't figure out why there was no real reason. And I just hit the slump, but strangely enough, right when I hit the slump, I get a cough from the school and they said, you've been doing really well out there. So like, oh, thank you. Well, do you think you could teach how you did well? Like, could you teach the students how that works out? I was like, yeah, I think so. I think I could do it. So I spent the next year at that point teaching when I could the students about what's like out there in the real world, working on projects. And they also asked me to help the students find jobs which I tried to do as much as I could. And then probably about a year into that, my wife at the time was working for David Kissinger and Alex Rockwell. Now David Kissinger is the president of Conan O'Brien's production company, Coca-Cola LLC, on an ad in the paper that said Conan O'Brien's moving out to Los Angeles to do The Tonight Show. I just asked him, I was like, hey, could you put my name in for it? And he was like, oh, yeah, I'll try, sure. So I'm teaching a class one day, I think it was like a Monday, and they call me and they're like, hey, is there any way you could be here in an hour for an interview? So I asked my buddy to cover the class. He went down there and they're like, oh, hey, David, give us your name. We have a bunch of editors moving out from New York, but we're looking to get started on stuff. And so we need you for about two weeks. Would you be up for that? I was like, yeah, yeah sure, man. Figure, hey, it's easy. It's The Tonight Show, it's an easy credit. Get to work for them for two weeks. I get to walk out saying I worked for The Tonight Show. Oh, I didn't even give them like a rate. I didn't even know how much I was going to get because it was two weeks, who cares? So I worked the two weeks and I, w I work on a I was there mostly to do it was the gift shop remote for the tonight show, which is still one of my favorites. And at the end of the two weeks, the end of that shift on Friday said, Hey, on Monday, could you come in and work on this other piece? I think Conan was like driving a car. It was like a music video type thing. Yeah, sure. Worked on that a week. Next, they're like, Hey, can you come in Monday and work on this? Yeah, sure. Three, four, five, six weeks go in. We, we had months of prep before the first Tonight Show. Three months later, still there. And it's the night before the first show. And I finally ask for a meeting with one of the producers, so Tracy King. And what hadn't had a lengthy conversation with you. I had a real quick one going in. She was like, hey, what's up? You okay? I was like, do I work here? And she was like, yes. Oh my God. Like, and so 12 years later, I kind of worked my way uh, up the food chain, so to speak, and I went through the Tonight Show with Conan and went through the transition when he did a, a live comedy across the U.S., worked with Robert Smigel, who's a Triumph the Insult comic doll, worked with him on videos on that, which brought me to uh, the birth of, of my first child shortly before Conan started. And once she was born, I really realized I needed to make as much money as humanly possible. So I got together with our lead editor at the time and our head of graphics, Eric Mil Eric McGilloway, and we decided to try to take more responsibility on the show. And the quickest way we could think of doing that was to design like the opening titles, the logos, the marketing materials, all that stuff, which would normally go to like an outside company. We did like a lottery approach. So each one of those came up with three pitches. So we came in, we presented nine pitches and they just, they picked mine. And so that kind of set the standard of how the next 12 years would go, where we were given this added responsibility because we offered it, obviously. And that was a big lesson for us that like, sometimes you want to be recognized for creativity. It's like, you got to just go for it and just create. Didn't you also design the original Conan logo and you incorporated yeah. your daughter into it? How did that happen? The original pitch of the Conan opening titles was based off of a title designer called Saul Bass. Now Saul did a lot of the 007 Alfred Hitch type titles, which uh, made a lot of use of silhouettes. Because I was trying to think at the time, especially, Conan was so huge on the internet. I was just trying to think of ideas that were both classic and modern at the same time. And to me, I was like, okay, internet, 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 icons. You see icons all the time. App icons, share icons, play icons, pause, all this stuff. And it was like symbols, okay. So I thought, okay, wouldn't it be interesting if like, it was like an app. It, that was the first thing I just thought. I was like, and everything had a symbol. Every guest comes on, they have some sort of symbol that represents them. Okay. Well, what about our regular guys? Oh, well, Andy's the announcer. So she, he should have a microphone. The band, Jimmy's got his guitar. So it should be good the guitar. Well, what's Conan? Well, he has his hair. 
So the hair wasn't supposed to be part of the logo. The logo was just supposed to be the word Conan, just Gotham font. It wasn't supposed to be fancy at all. But they saw the opening and they liked it a lot. But little did they know, I hid uh, little Easter eggs for myself in the opening design. So if you look above the word Conan in the black silhouette, you'll see kind of an angled shot of what is an outline of my daughter looking up to the sky, which was way more incredibly obvious when it was just part of the opening titles. But uh, what's that? Whenever they wanted it to be part of the logo, I did a real, I, I made it way less descript. But it was fun. It was fun to hide that in there. And I hung that over Dan Dome, especially. I told him up top, I was like, Elliot's in this open, by the way, and he could never figure out where it was, which is good because I was definitely afraid that someone was going to bust me on it. When you were first working with Conan, what was it like to have to deliver a 42 minute show in 90 minutes? It must have been, at the start, quite terrifying. It was, and, and it's funny too, because at the end, the show was the most relaxing part. I guess that's just how it goes. But yeah, I mean, when I first started on The Tonight Show, we had some hairy nights because we would film at 4.30, I'm pretty sure. So you're done at 5.30 filming and you're on the air at eight. So you have two and a half hours. But in NBC, because at the time their equipment was older, I don't even know how it's like now. But at the time their equipment was older, so you actually had to get from the show by seven because they had to recomposite the show. Now, what I mean by that is they had to re-record the show. And while they were recording, they would lay in all the NBC logos and the commercial breaks and all that kind of stuff. So they had to have a certain time. They wouldn't have to have the whole show necessarily by seven, but at least the first act, because the first act was always like 20 minutes. And it was a way to buy us some time. But there's one night in particular where we were sprinting down the hall to get them a tape in time. Because every night we would broadcast, we would actually have it playing digitally from our studio in case the feed ever went bad, they could switch over to us. And we literally turned it in probably about nine seconds before we hit it. So we had a couple nights like that. There was one, it was such a short bit too, but President Obama. He was debating an interview with somebody. There was a fly flying around in the interview. And it was just a quick little gag of like a large tongue coming out of his mouth, like eating it like a frog. And something went terribly wrong. And I don't remember why, but they wanted to fix the shot. And we turned it in literally a half a second before he called for it on stage. I remember that particular night because myself and the head writer at the time, after we turned it, we both like just fell to the ground. They just kind of <laughs> laid it and just like stared up to the ceiling and just waited for a laugh to come. But it's one of those things that you start to really get a talent for breaking down how long an hour can be and how you can cut minutes out of what you're doing all the time. Because as tight as that schedule sounds, on any typical night, it wasn't that hard because we knew what we were doing. We knew every little step we could take to get things to where it needed to go as quickly as possible. When the nights were challenging, oh yeah. Yeah, that didn't feel great. <laughs> Is it possible to put into words what you were looking for that allowed you to speed through and figure out what to put into the show and what to cut? Uh, no, because the priority would be different according to the show. Because uh, the thing about television is it has to be a certain amount of time. You can't call the network and be like, hey, our show is really good tonight. Can we have five extra minutes? Then they go, no, we have this many commercials we need to play. It needs to be 42 minutes or, you know, whatever it was at the time. I think it was 42, 30. So comedy was always the thing you try to save. So normally the time would come out of the interview. If it could, on particular nights where the interview went particularly well, comedy would pay the price that night. I mean, these days, especially towards the end, I mean, everything ends up online anyway. I mean, everything's important. You just need to get your show version done and then do your exports for YouTube and all that. Kind of, especially in the interviews now, because towards the end, Conan would do 30 minutes straight with a guest. We would even like stop the interview to be like, we're going to cut to commercial. See you in a second. Like we never did that anymore to keep the flow of the conversation going. It's sometimes things you'd cover mistakes. Sometimes people said stuff they shouldn't. It, it would really just kind of depend. Do you feel like your work has evolved over time? Because as you said earlier, when you first started, it was 42 minutes. Now you can put everything online. So you don't have to feel as like no one will ever see this really good bit because of a lack of time. Yeah, no, it was never about that. What made it more challenging would be the more versions of something that you have, the easier it is to mess it up. Because if in the Tonight Show days, you turn in your show and that's it. That's all you're doing. 
well, towards the end, we were got to do the show. Now you got to do the web highlights. Now you got to do the extras. Now you got to do the serious monologue export for that day. Now the people who arrange the sponsored segments need copy of this segment, that sort of thing. So that's where it could get crazy because your laundry list of things to do will change. Run around like a chicken with its head cut off, but especially be challenging on the times when we would be doing not just the late night show, but also a Coles travel show. There might be a pilot happening at the same time. There might be an award show um, being worked on at the same time. That, that's where things would get very challenging. But the hope is that you have people around you that A, support you, which I did all the time. Wonderful editors, had a wonderful post coordinator had a wonderful associate director of post and we would always work towards the common goal of getting everything done and try to get everything done in a way that people didn't have to split their attention too much so what i mean by that is like if today i need you to work on a travel show i'm trying to create an environment where you just work on the travel show and not have to do four other things but that meant i'm doing all the late night show that sort of thing so everyone had their part to play but everyone always did such a great job for those travel segments what was the most time-consuming parts of it? Ingest, always ingest. You don't necessarily know what's important. And just by pure length, where a late night show, yeah, you have your multiple cameras, but it's being done through a control room. It gets routed, it gets ingested, just like a TiVo or DVR. It's very simple, but when they had three cameras of 18 hours a piece, and you're going to be on the air in eight days, you go, whoa. <laughs> so ingest in that first assembly, because it's that first run through of going through everything, looking at what you've got, figuring out where the issues are, figuring out, of course, where the funny is, which is the most important part, of course. But yeah, once you got that first cut done, almost everything after that is way simpler because you try to bring it to a place of, here's everything that I think is funny. Now let's sit with it, fine tune it, make it shorter because the longer is never the answer. Then it just becomes the question of, do you need this? Do you need this? Do you need this? That sort of thing. And the luxury of having a plethora of jokes to pick from, then you start going, well, can this segment hold audience for 10 minutes or can it hold them for five minutes? Because if it can hold them for five minutes, I may have a bunch of A-level jokes, but if it's not going to hold, then some of them got to go. So let's kill some darlings here. (laughs) And how challenging was it to do that high tea segment? where they were filming for four days and you had a one-week editorial schedule. That one in Greenland were the hardest ones to turn around because they both had the same challenge, which was they were both based on news stories that were happening at the time. So you had to do them quickly before the world forgot the news story. Because the worst thing would be for the show to air to be like, oh, President Trump said he was going to buy Greenland three months ago. We just made a show. No, no it's got to be in a week. But the plus in both those approaches were we could cut to the heart of things quicker. And what I mean by that is that if I gave you an hour hour to do something, everyone could turn out a great thing in an hour. Would it have been better if you had three hours? It might have been, but what you turned out was great in an hour. And sometimes, yeah, it might've been better at three. Definitely would not have been better at seven. See what I mean? It's like sometimes fiddling with something for too long does it no favors either. So that became like the ultimate version of speed chess on the show. What's funny? What's funny? What's funny? And then also trying to fill in what we could authoritatively in terms of history, facts about the nation, what message we're trying to have for each piece, that sort of thing. You mentioned the word speed chess. What does that mean? Did you see... Queen's Gambit? No, no that, that's, a, that's a good thing to bring up, but I didn't see Queen's Gambit, so I can actually comment on it. But did you see uh, Pixar's Soul? There's a version that they talk about in creativity where you're in the zone on something and you just kind of get lost in the thing. That's kind of what speech is, is you don't necessarily know why you're making the moves you're making. You just make them without thinking too hard about what you're doing. I'm a prime, prime believer in not judging any piece until it's completed on a timeline. Not finished, completed. Till I have a whole beginning, middle, and an end on a timeline to look at, where I understand how all the cameras are relating to each other, where I understand what all the jokes are, where the, how the script comes into play, how the actors come into play. So I will do everything in my power to get anything on a timeline as quickly as possible. A lot of editors tend to worry about the planning of what that is and how things should be laid out. They analyze each take and they're looking at things that are relating to each other without it being in a timeline, without it seeing how it relates to it one another. It's almost like a fear of being wrong. I don't care if I'm wrong. If I'm wrong, that's fine. We'll do it on the next pass. 
but I need to have something to look at so we know what we're dealing with. And that's what speechness is. You can't even really put it into words after 12 years of cutting a late night. One of the most common things you would be asked to edit is a mock commercial. I would dare say that towards the end, I could do those without ever having to read a script again, because I, I know the rhythms and there's comfort in them. They're written specifically to the rhythm because it allows the audience to be in on the presentation. You want them to come on this journey with you. You don't want them to be worried about where they're going. So you give them the comfort of having the structure. What do you mean by rhythm? A mock commercial. Tired of having blue cups to drink for all your water? Try red cups. That sort of thing. So mock commercial starts. You put a creepy drone. Kick it in. Rob Ash doesn't want you to have a red cup. He thinks you should be drinking from the blue cup. Well, let's show him. Music changes by bringing in red cups for $2.50. Go down to the, you know, that sort of thing. There's a rhythm to it. So you do the setup, you flip it with music, you show the product, you make your three to four jokes, reflecting the product or whatever message that you're trying to get for the cross. You show the product again and you add the tag. Red cup, get yours now. Only nine, 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 nine. There's a rhythm to it. And what is it you mentioned before, editing comedy? It must be very different from editing something that isn't comedy. There's a couple different ways to look at it. So there's man on the street comedy, which is different than scripted comedy. Man on the street comedy, if you watch a lot of it, a lot of shots tend to be wide. On man on the street comedy, a lot of shots tend to have jump counts. Man on the street comedy, because you're not bound to a narrative structure, not bound to be shot like a film. And also you want to stay wide as much as possible because it's about the relationship between who is talking and who is listening. And you want that to play as live as possible. You don't want it to seem edited because if it seems edited, it will seem fake. So you're doing as much as you can to keep it energetic. Even if the bit's like ridiculous, you still want the presentation to look real because it'll take the audience out. They'll be like, ah, you're trying to trick me with your editing. It really comes off that way. So man of the street comedy. It's about watching the relationship between the two people play out in real time. Scripted comedy is about hiding the reaction of the relationship between the two people. I'm Michael Scott from The Office. You have the camera on me. I say something crazy that would normally get me punched in the face. I wait till the absolute last second to cut to Jim or whoever's listening to him to give that look to the camera. To let the audience know that Jim feels exactly how they feel. Like, oh, can you believe this going? That's scripted comedy. It's about hiding that relationship because you're playing with the rhythm of that to really punch whatever joke you're trying to do in terms of the story. Sometimes you run into a situation where you could really have to help things aesthetically, but it's rare. Scripted comedy, on the other hand, it is about the structure and how when you hide things, who's got the power in the, whatever the scene is playing out, that sort of thing. And what was it like cutting for The Notebook 2? Oh, <laughs> That one, wow, we just did that like two hours before the show. That, that one, that one to me was very special because I love Ryan Reynolds and I, I just love that particular piece so much. And the day that we had to cut it, it and sometimes tight turnarounds can be hard and sometimes they're not. And that time it wasn't because I knew what it was going to be right away. I had the script before they filmed it. So I was already picking music, already made the graphics, already made the titles. And I kind of imagined what they were going to film and what shots I would probably want for each thing. And so when it came in, I just filled it in. I had it turned around less than an hour easily. Like once again, when you're turning around a piece that quickly, not a whole lot of time to think. Sometimes the most obvious answer is the answer that you want. Do you feel like the process, I mean, it was different for you when you went from 42 minutes to 30 minutes? Uh, me personally, no, because... My main duty on the show has always been the comedy on the top, the monologue, the sketches, the ads. When I started on the show, I mostly did interviews and stuff like that. So if I was still doing interviews, absolutely the format would have changed. Probably would have been tougher for me too, because they had more to cut. 